There is a wonderful heart to serve that is present among the members of this church. From the time I have arrived, I have noticed how many individuals are here prior to this meeting serving all that will take place in this meeting. That is an expression of humility. That, that is an effect of the gospel in your lives. You not only have this humble heart to serve, you do so happily. This is a really happy place. There, there is a pronounced joy, which again is a pronounced effect of the gospel. So this is a happy place. You are a joyful people. And it's no surprise that in our experience privately, um, to be with Tim and Al, they are happy pastors. Uh, and they, they are happy pastors because they love serving you. I, I only wish you could overhear them talk about you in private. Because as they reference you uh, spontaneously in casual conversation, they, they immediately reference their love for you, their gratefulness to God for you, and what a joy it is to serve you. And now, having met you, I understand what they're talking about. So, I just want to say at the outset, thank you. Thank you for this invitation. It's humbling to be here. It's an honor to be here. And thank you for making it a joy to pastor you. Uh, happy pastors glorify God. Uh, unhappy pastors do not glorify God. And across the earth, there are just, sadly, too many unhappy pastors today. Uh, not here, not in this place. In this place, there are happy pastors because you make it a joy to pastor. Let me tell you something else I've noticed about you that's quite obvious. is You not only have a heart to serve, you have a heart to advance the gospel. Um, and that's evident by your support of this conference and your support of your pastors as they serve and lead in the context of this conference. That's a heart, that demonstrates a heart to advance the gospel uh, throughout this country and throughout the world. Uh, that is unselfish of you. So thank you for supporting your pastors in this venture to serve pastors through these conferences for the purpose of advancing the gospel and building the church ultimately for the glory of God. None of that happens apart from what's happening here in this church. So for me, regardless of what happens from this point to the conclusion of my time, this is going to be the most meaningful time for me, getting to know you and being with you. So thank you very much. And how cool is it next week you get Mark Dever and Kevin DeYoung. Those are two of uh, just my closest friends and my favorite preachers on the planet. And today you were led in worship by my favorite worship leader. So I'm just, I'm really happy for you. <laughs> How the Lord is blessing you. What a privilege and joy it is to be here. Now I have the privilege to address you from God's Word. So, please open your Bibles to what one scholar identifies as, quote, probably the most neglected book in the New Testament, and according to this scholar, that distinction belongs to the letter of Jude. So if you please turn in your Bibles to the letter of Jude, you'll find the letter of Jude just prior to the book of Revelation. And the scholars, the smart guys who serve us so well with their commentaries, they, they provide us, they provide us with their educated speculation on why this letter, the letter of Jude, is routinely neglected. They, they inform us that this letter is neglected because of its brevity, it's neglected because of its emphasis upon judgment for false teachers who have infiltrated the church and are perverting the gospel and troubling the church. The, it is neglected because of the severity of its tone and content, particularly in the main body of the letter, and all of that is no doubt true, but as Dr. Tom Schreiner writes in his commentary on Jude, nevertheless, some of the most beautiful statements about God's sustaining grace are found in Jude. 
Some of the most beautiful statements in all of Scripture about God's sustaining grace are found in Jude. And I want to draw your attention this morning to one of those beautiful statements. So, I now have the privilege to read you from Jude, beginning in verse 1. And let, let each of us, let each of us anticipate being addressed by God as I have this privilege to read the Word of God and then to serve you in the preaching of the Word of God. Because God is eager to bless His people through the reading and preaching of His Word when they gather to give attention to His Word. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, Loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. After a humble introduction of himself in verse 1a, Jude provides us with a most humbling, most comforting, most encouraging, and most amazing description of the Christian in verse 1b. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. This morning, we are going to confine our attention to these Stunning words. I, I have a tendency, perhaps you do as well, I, I have a tendency to read the opening words of a New Testament letter quickly. I have a tendency to read over these words quickly and to assume that these words form little more than a polite, ancient formality. These opening words... These opening words are divinely inspired. These opening words are no fear formality. These opening words are filled. They are filled with theological substance. They are invested with theological purpose. They anticipate the primary themes of the letter and they prepare the hearts of the original recipients for the exhortations and the warnings that are to follow. And they are intended to serve us in similar ways this morning. So in order to understand the significance, the purpose, and feel the full effect of these opening words, we just need to just briefly understand and consider the primary purpose of this letter so that we can understand the purpose of these opening words. This letter is a call to contend. It's a call to contend for the gospel. Jude's primary purpose for writing this letter is clear and explicit. This letter is a call to contend for the gospel. He makes that clear at the outset in verse 3. Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, he found it necessary to write, necessary to write, appealing to them to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And in verse 4, he gives the reason why false teachers have infiltrated the church and they are perverting the gospel of grace. This forms Jude's primary purpose for writing this letter. It is an exhortation. It is a call to the church to contend for the gospel in light of false teachers and the influence of false teaching upon the church. 
But prior to exhorting them to contend for the gospel, Jude reminds them of the gospel in verse 1b. In effect, he roots their contending in grace. He reminds them of the gospel before he exhorts them to contend for the gospel. He, in effect, insists that we contemplate the gospel before we contend for the gospel. These divinely inspired opening words in this letter are not meant to be read quickly. They are meant to be read slowly and considered carefully for the wealth of grace that is revealed in and through these words. Sinclair Ferguson describes this opening verse as one of the sweetest openings and introductions of any book in the Bible. One of the sweetest openings and introductions of any book of the Bible. And since it is one of the sweetest openings and introductions of any book in the Bible, we are, I think, going to wisely devote the remainder of this sermon to this sweet introduction so that we might feel the full effect of this sweet introduction upon our hearts so that we might experience the full effect of this sweet introduction in our lives. Three simple points all derived, I trust, from this text. Three points. Called. Loved. We begin with called. To those who are called. The word called is one of the most frequent one word description of the Christian in the New Testament. One of the most frequent one word description of the Christian in the New Testament is the word called. So let me ask you this morning how familiar are you with one of the most frequent one word descriptions of the Christian in the New Testament? Well, because you are taught well, I can assume you have familiarity with this designation of the Christian. You need to be familiar with this one word description of the Christian because if you are a Christian this morning, this one word describes why you are a Christian. This, this one word, call, is the theological explanation for why you are a Christian if you are a Christian. And this one word, call, reveals a wealth of grace that should leave every Christian this morning freshly amazed. So, if you are a Christian and you aren't presently amazed by the grace of God, perhaps... Perhaps it's because you aren't familiar with this one word description of a Christian, or perhaps you were once familiar with this one word description, but in recent months you've neglected this description and forgotten this description of why you are a Christian. Jude is here to serve us this morning and to remind us of the theological explanation of why you are a Christian so that we can experience the full effect of this one word description upon our souls and in our lives so that we can be freshly amazed, so that we can be increasingly amazed. If you are a Christian, here's why. If you are a Christian, it is because you have been graciously and personally and effectually called by God himself through the preaching of the gospel. If you are a Christian, you became a Christian because God called you. It's because you received a gracious call from God through the proclamation of the gospel, a gracious call you did not deserve. Now, this, this call Jude is referencing, and I'm drawing attention to, this call is not to be confused with the general call of God to all to repent and believe the gospel. No, this, this call isn't simply an invitation, a general invitation that awaits our favorable response or decline. No, the call that Jude is referencing here is a summons. The call Jude is referencing here is a divine Summons. Alec Matir in his commentary says, It is not God's invitation to be saved. It is God's determination to save. So this call, this reference to call, it accents the sovereign grace of God. 
This reference to call accents the initiative of God in our conversion. So Jude is succinctly stating here that divine action preceded human decision. It's not minimizing the importance of repentance and faith. He's just drawing attention first and foremost to divine initiative. He's drawing attention to, in effect, sovereign grace. He is succinctly and emphatically stating to us this morning that if you are a Christian, before you came to God, God came to you. And if he hadn't come to you, you never would have come to him. If he hadn't acted upon you, you never would have acted in response to him. And one cannot fully appreciate the nature and effect of this call unless, unless one understands the condition of the human heart prior to this call. And the condition of the human heart prior to this gracious call of God is, is described in the passage that we read earlier and was wonderfully brought to our attention by Bob in worship. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 reads as follows. And in this verse, we are introduced to, well, these devastating words. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And that would be a description of each and every one of us prior to this gracious call of God. You were dead. So was I. You were dead in sin not responsive to God, hostile to God, incapable of altering this condition of your heart. Before you came to God, God came to you, because if he didn't come to you, you never would have come to him. See, your conversion did not originate with you. Your conversion was not initiated by you. Whenever I have the privilege to preach, I normally reference my historical hero, the British pastor, Charles Spurgeon. Listen to Mr. Spurgeon make this plain to us when he writes, Now, the reasons why no man ever started the work of grace in his own hearts are very plain and palpable. Firstly, because he cannot. And secondly, because he will not. The best reason of all is because he cannot. He is dead. If you are a Christian this morning, here's why you're a Christian. God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. If you're a Christian this morning, your conversion is by God's gracious calling. That, that, that is the clear teaching of Scripture. And is that not confirmed by your experience as well? Come on. If you're a Christian, surely you are aware that God initiated it all. You, you didn't discover Him. He revealed himself to you. You didn't discover him. You weren't seeking him unless he acts upon you. You were dead. And in effect, when we encounter this one word description of the Christian, it's an invitation to retrace our conversion experience so that we would be reminded of the origin of our conversion experience. Retrace your Christian experience so that you would be reminded. And on one particular Sunday evening, Mr. Spurgeon sought to lead his congregation in retracing their conversion experience. And he addressed his congregation wisely and tenderly with the following words. He said, let me refresh your memories with your calling. Was there not a day, the mementos of which you fondly cherished when you were called from death unto life? Fly back now, Mr. Spurgeon said. Fly back now to the day and hour if you can. And if not, 
light upon the season thereabouts. So if you can't locate the day and the time and the moment, you should be able to locate the season thereabouts. And Mr. Spurgeon exhorts us to fly back now to either that day, moment, or season when the great transaction took place in which you were made Christ forever by the voluntary surrender of yourself to Him. And then he says, in looking back, does it not strike you that your calling must have been of divine origin? How gracious that calling must have been, since it came to you from God, came to you irresistibly, and came to you with such personal demonstration. What grace was here? And then he says this, what was there in you to suggest a motive why God should call you. What was there in you that should, that should suggest a motive why God should call you? Oh, beloved, he said, we can hardly ask that question without the tear rising in our eye. Should, should not this calling of ours evoke our most intense gratitude, our most earnest love? Oh, if he had not called thee, where hadst thou been tonight? Who am I? What should I have been if the Lord in mercy had not stopped me in my mad career? This was a kind and gracious call when we consider what we might have been. If he had not called you, let me ask you, where would you have been this morning? If he had not called me, I can assure you, I would not be standing here before you this morning. But what, let me ask you this, what would you have become if he had not stopped you in your mad career of sin? Listen, if it's been some time since you've teared up, if it's been some time since you've felt intense gratitude and earnest love, well, perhaps this morning it would serve your soul to be refreshed with a memory of your calling. Because if you're a Christian, every Christian has this in common. This, this was true of you, whether your conversion experience was dramatic like Paul's or similar to Lydia's. We read of her conversion in the book of Acts as follows. It just says that the Lord opened her heart as Paul was preaching. Now if you were present that day and observed what took place in Lydia's life, it wouldn't appear at first glance as dramatic as Paul's conversion. But let me just, let me just remind you from scripture that every conversion is dramatic. Every conversion is the miracle of miracles. So whether your conversion was more like Paul's and apparently a dramatic one, or whether your conversion happened more quietly and over a period of time, more like Lydia's, God called you. The only explanation for your conversion for your, for your conversion. The theological explanation for your conversion is the gracious personal call of God through the proclamation of the gospel. God stopped you in your mad career. And so whether he stopped you in an apparent dramatic way or in what appeared to be a more quiet way, whether he stopped you when you were young or whether he stopped you when you were old. And by the way, I would argue the younger he stopped you, the more gracious the call seems to be. I mean, my, my personal testimony is, is of a more dramatic nature. And over the years, as I've described my testimony, as I've informed people of, of my immersion prior to my conversion in the drug culture, my, sadly, and to my shame, my passion for sin. Listen, had you met me prior to my conversion, I loved all manner of sin that was associated with the drug culture I was fully invested in. I was not a reluctant participant. 
I loved sin. And I loved the drug culture. And I loved all the attendance sins related to the drug culture. And I certainly didn't identify them as sins prior to my conversion. My conversion took place in a single evening. It would have been the first time at 18 years old when I heard the gospel. I was dramatically converted one evening. As a friend shared the gospel with me, God acted upon me, revealed my sin to me, and revealed the provision of a Savior for my sin to me. He acted upon my heart. He regenerated my heart. And by the grace of God, I responded in repentance and faith. And I was a immediately and dramatically changed. And the world I occupied was not prepared for me the next day. So my conversion was a dramatic one, apparently. And so as I've shared that over the years, oh, I've had this happen countless times, where I've had individuals come to me who were converted at an early age. And they come to me apologetic. They come to me saying, I wish, I only wish I had a testimony like yours. And they often use this phrase, I have a boring testimony. I was converted at five years old, convicted that I wasn't sharing my Legos with my brother. I was convicted in the context of Sunday school as the teacher preached the gospel. And I turned from my sins at five and trusted in the Savior for the forgiveness of sins at five. And I don't have a testimony like yours. And oh, if you approach me with that line after this meeting, uh, I want to have a little chat with you. And here's what I want to say with you. Listen, I would argue yours was more dramatic than mine. He stopped you in your mad career at five. How gracious of God to stop you at five. You should be amazed that he intervened in your life and stopped your mad career before your mad career could get started as a mad <coughs> career. I once heard of an elder giving testimony who said, the Lord saved me from a life of drugs, crime, and adultery at the age of six. <laughs> That is a biblical perspective of being stopped in one's mad career at an early age. This is regardless of whether it was apparently dramatic or quiet, regardless of whether it was when you were young or older. If you're a Christian, you have been converted. Because in the mystery of his mercy, God called you through the preaching of the gospel and acted upon your dead heart and made you alive together with Christ. You're a Christian. That's why you're a Christian. But why would God do this? Why would God call sinners like you and me through the proclamation of the gospel? I mean, what, what motivated him to call you since we were dead in our sins and richly deserving his righteous wrath because of our sins? And it is as, uh, it is as if Jude anticipates this question. God called you because he loved you. Second point, loved. Called, loved. Be loved by God the Father. So having reminded the original recipients they've been called by God, Jude now provides them with the divine motivation for this call. So if you are a Christian, you're a Christian because you've been called by God, if you've been called by God, it's because you have been loved by God the Father Himself. So if you look behind the call of God, you discover the love of God the Father for sinners like you and me. So when we look behind the call of God, what a stunning and happy discovery. We discover the 
the love of God the Father. The original recipients of this letter needed this assurance, this assurance of the love of God the Father. And, well, particularly given the size of this wonderful congregation, perhaps you need this assurance this morning as well. From, from, my, from my pastoral experience over the years, many genuine Christians need the assurance of the Father's love. Actually, I think all Christians need this assurance. But I've, I've interacted with many Christians over the years who are not, listen, they are not certain God loves them. I mean, they can be reluctant to admit it, but they aren't convinced. They aren't convinced in their heart and mind that God loves them. In, in light of their sin and the holiness of God, they, they can wonder. They can wonder whether God does indeed love them. They, they find themselves often suspicious of God, suspicious of His love for them. They are dogged by doubt, not, not occasional doubt, but persistent doubt as to whether God loves them. They tend to think of God as merely tolerating them, often disappointed with them, eager to discipline them, and perhaps this morning you are one of them. Perhaps you are one of them. Are you uncertain about the disposition of God the Father toward you? If, if internally this is resonating, you, said, you would say, yeah, I'm not certain. I don't want to be certain. I don't want to be convinced, but I, I am dogged by doubt. I'm not convinced. I'm not certain. Listen, you must not remain uncertain. God the Father wants you to be certain. And if you are uncertain, if you are uncertain about the disposition of God the Father towards you, it will affect, well, it will affect everything. <laughs> it will affect your communion with God. It will affect your service of God. Until you are convinced of the Father's love for you, until you are growing in your understanding of the Father's love for you, you will be vulnerable to all manner of introspection, legalism, condemnation, discouragement, and despair. And until you grasp this, until to some degree you are convinced of this, there will be the distinct absence of joy in your life. And Jude wants the original recipients of this letter to be convinced. He wants them to be convinced of the Father's love. He wants them to have a proper view of the Father, an accurate view of the Father. The Father called. The Father summoned sinners like you and me through the preaching of the gospel as an expression of his electing affection that was determined before the creation of the world. Your conversion took place because he loved you. He loved you with a personal and a particular affection. That is the divine motivation behind your conversion. And all Christians, all Christians are to be convinced of the love of God the Father. All Christians are to be able to say humbly and confidently, I am loved personally by God the Father. All Christians are to say this, to be able to say this. All Christians are to be certain they are loved by God. Listen, but where you look for that certainty makes all the difference. So you are to be certain if you're a Christian you are loved by the Father, but where you look for that certainty makes all the difference. So, a word of counsel and caution. Resist the impulse to look within. To look within yourself for the reason 
for God's love for you. Resist that impulse because it doesn't exist there. If you look within, all you will find is the sin that actually would convince you that God should judge you and not love you. The Puritan Thomas Watson said the following, We have enough in us to move God to correct us, but nothing to move Him to adopt us. Therefore, exalt free grace, begin the work of angels here, Bless him with your praise who hath blessed you in making you his sons and daughters. Listen. Do not resist the impulse to look within to find within a reason for God's love for you. Resist that impulse because it's a false hope. Because there's not a thing within you and me that inclined God to love sinners like you and me. Not a thing within. No. You need your attention turned outside of yourself and away from yourself to God the Father and a hill called Calvary. And that's exactly what Jude is doing here. Do you, do you notice in this entire passage, he's not drawing our attention within ourselves. He's not drawing attention to our subjective experience. No, this, this verse is just indicative after indicative after indicative. He is informing us. He is announcing to us. He is directing our attention to behold the gracious character and work of God in our lives through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He, he's actually intervening in our lives and saying to us, in effect, no, don't look within. No, no, don't look within. Look without. Look without. Look to God the Father. Look to a hill called Calvary. For it's there you will discover the call of God, the gracious call of God. And it is there you will be convinced of God's love for you. Not, not by endlessly studying yourself or exploring within yourself, seeking to find within yourself a reason why God would love you. Over the decades, I've often come across individuals who are discouraged, if not in despair. They are not convinced of God's love for them. And so I find them at times saying something like this. They will be in tears after a meeting saying something like this, if not exactly this. How could God love me in light of my sin? Why would God love me? Now, what I try to do to serve them is respond to them in an affectionate, wise, humorous, serious way. In order to obtain their attention, I will normally say something like this. I am as perplexed as you are as to why God loves you. I mean, what little I know of you <laughs> leaves me as perplexed as you as to why God would love you. Aware of the sin I've observed in your life, I have no clue how God could love you. I'm not going to come alongside them and try to confirm for them that there really is something attractive in you, about you, unusually lovely in you and about you that would draw God's love to you. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that because that's not going to serve them. It's not true. You were unworthy. And yet in your unworthy state, the Father somehow in the mystery of his mercy, wanted you and sent his only innocent son to be your substitute in your place condemned. He stood crushed by the Father under the weight of his wrath and with your sin 
Why? Because he loved you. Not because you were worthy. You were not worthy. By the way, you aren't worthy. You will never be worthy in and of yourself. See, this is one of our challenges. It's one of our challenges theologically. It's one of our challenges experientially. We, we are aware we are unworthy. And so it's difficult for us to reconcile our unworthiness with this certainty of God's love. You and I will always be unworthy. And yet, we will always be loved by God the Father. That's why we should always be amazed by the grace of God. <laughs> See, this is not informing you you are unworthy. Should ultimately leave you humbled and amazed by grace. As you contemplate the love of God the Father. So, why does God love sinners like you and me? Here's the best attempt I've read at an answer. Puritan. Thomas Manton wrote, Love is at the bottom of it all. And we may give reason of other things, but we cannot give a reason of his love. If you ask why he made so much ado about a worthless creature raised out of the dust of ground at first, and had now disordered himself and could be of no use to him, we have an answer at hand. Because he loved us. If you continue to ask, but why did he love us? Well, we have no other answer, but because he loved us. That is in short, he loved you because he loved you. All came from his free and undeserved mercy. Higher we cannot go in seeking after the causes of what is done for our salvation. Oh, brothers and sisters, it is a mystery. Is a mystery of his mercy, and we will marvel at this love throughout all eternity. Those the Father calls, he loves. And finally, those the Father loves, he calls. And those the Father loves and calls, he preserves. It'll be real brief. But the final phrase kept. Kept. Called love kept. Called love kept. Well, listen, when I, when I first began to study the book of Jude and outline what I was anticipating to be a series of sermons, I, I didn't know, am I going to do this a single sermon, two sermons, three, four? I, I, was, I was working through the text, trying to craft an outline. It, it was as if one bee had a voice and was just demanding my attention and demanding that I devote an entire sermon to one bee. And, and ultimately, one bee, in effect, uh, Luther talks about the, the, the Bible having hands and laying hold of us, and feet and running after us and overtaking us. So, and that's what happened to me. The more, the more I meditated on the letter of Jude, the more one bee ran after me, ran me down, overtook me, and changed my life. And I pray the same thing is happening to you this morning. I, I, I pray this morning that called, loved, and now kept just <laughs> overtakes your life. And from this place, those three words and all they reveal just change your life. Those he calls, he loves. Those he loves, he calls. And he keeps them. Kept for Jesus Christ. Oh, I mean, listen. In these few words, we have this just breathtaking revelation of God the Father that begins in eternity past with His electing love and extends to eternity future. He will keep us from every danger, from every toil, from every snare. He will protect and preserve us from all dangers, both doctrinal and circumstantial. He will protect and preserve us from the influence and the effect of sin. Yes, we are called to persevere, but we will effectively and successfully persevere only because He is preserving us and has promised to preserve us. He who has called us loved us, and he who has called us and loved us will not abandon us. He who began a good work in us will bring it to completion until the day of Jesus. 
Jesus Christ. Those he calls, he loved. And those he loves and calls, he keeps. And in verse 2, Jude prays. He prays that mercy and peace and love be multiplied to the original recipients. Not added, multiplied. And I'm assuming that you have arrived here today needing fresh mercy, peace, and love. I pray that it would be multiplied to you. Can't improve on Jude's prayer. Seems like the only, only appropriate response of Jude, transitioning from 1A, is to pray for this multiplication of mercy and peace and love. How is mercy, peace, and love multiplied in my life? Mercy, peace, and love are multiplied as we meditate on all that is revealed in one being. Called, loved, kept, all by His grace and all for His glory. Let's pray. Father, I pray that those who are convinced of your love for them would be freshly reminded of your love for them and freshly amazed by your grace for them. I pray for all genuine Christians here who are uncertain of your love for them. I pray they would be convinced of your love for them as they contemplate your call of them through the proclamation of the gospel, how that call reveals your love for them and your promise here to keep all those you call. But I pray for those who have come today who are not Christians. I'm so grateful they are here today listening. I pray they will respond to your call that they repent and turn from their sin and trust in the Savior for the forgiveness of sin. Have, have mercy on them, Lord, just like you've had mercy on me. Just like you've had mercy on those who make up this church. Have mercy on non-Christians who have come today listening in aware of, now freshly aware of their sin and the burden of their sin and their incapability of altering their condition. Oh Lord, may they flee to the cross, turn from their sin, receive forgiveness of sin and freedom from fear of future wrath, all because of your Son and His sacrifice on the cross. Father, thank you. Multiply mercy peace and love. In Jesus' name, amen.